Hello, Mike. Hey, Caio. So many viewers have expressed some difficulty when it comes to reading diagrams. Right. So why don't we explain through a simple demonstration all these arrows that we pull from one component to another and interfaces, protocols, all these things. Yeah, and we can write code and show the diagram evolution as we go. Yeah, I like that. But before we start, why do we write diagrams? Right. <laughs> why do we draw them? Why? Well, uh, it's a communication tool for ourselves uh, and for other developers in the team. And when I say ourselves, I mean our future selves as well, you know, uh, understand what was the thinking process at the time and um, document it in a way. The other thing that I like about diagrams is that you can validate your design decisions because you can see what module uh, talks to what module, for example. So it's easier to see the dependency graph. Right of your object, of your classes, or even your functions, if you're writing some functional code base. Absolutely, absolutely. And also, it helps find memory leaks, potential memory leaks, right? Not actual memory leaks, because we would probably need instruments or something to find that. Well, we can visually see some retain cycle. Yes, exactly. And to be fair, it's very easy for the code to evolve and the diagrams get out of sync. So there's a good argument not to keep them as documentation. I don't keep them as documentation most of the times. I mostly use diagrams when, for example, I'm starting to write a feature in a team and we can pair in the beginning and we draw some diagrams just to put our thoughts on paper. It might take us like five, 10 minutes to come up with an initial plan. So it's just a framework to think. It's not always documentation. As you said, it's a communication tool. Yeah, I think you make a very good point there because it's a bad investment, actually. After some <laughs> sort of um, complexity being introduced in the system, then it's just too costly to keep track of all changes. And if you don't have a tool that will produce these diagrams for you, that it will translate the source code into diagrams, I mean, then I agree with you 100%. And I've never seen a good tool that can do that for me. So <laughs> Right, exactly. Maybe there is. Maybe I'm being unfair here. but Maybe one of our viewers will make it. Yes, please. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's start writing some code. Great. Why don't we start with the example last time, the feed view controller. So we had a class. It was a feed view controller, right? That's how we started, yes. So how does this exactly code we have right here translate to a diagram? Right. So this is just a class, a single component and it has no references, no dependencies, no behavior, nothing. So we can represent it with just this box. And its name, right. But in our example, in the previous episode, this class inherit from UI view controller. Right. So just by doing that, <laughs> by importing UI kit <laughs> and inheriting from UI view controller, that's a modular dependency. So we need to introduce that in the diagram. So now it looks like this. We inherit from view controller, and since it's another module, let's use a different color to represent it. I like that. So the feed view controller inherit from UI view controller, which means we now depend not just on UI view controller, but UI kit. Exactly. Because that's the module where UI view controller is defined. Thus, we had to import UI kit here. And that's a source code dependency to UI kit from our project. And the strongest of the couplings, inheritance. <laughs> That is true. <laughs> well, we had some more dependencies here in the previous episode. We had the, the load feed closure. Right. So let me quickly paste this here. There you go. Very nice. So we have a closure where we could load a feed. And in this case, let's say it's an array of strings so we can render in a table view yeah. or a collection view. It's simple enough. And on view did load, we invoke the load feed closure and expect to get some items. Right. That's pretty common. And we update the UI. Yes. But now we have a new dependency. It's a closure. Right. But even though it's a function, it's still a dependency. Absolutely. We have a dependency on the signature of this type. And the signature is this. Yes, exactly. It's a closure. So we can even name this. Just to make this clear, let's call it a feed loader. Now we can replace it here. And that's what it is. It's still a dependency. 
I can pass any closure that have the same signature, which means even though we are passing a closure, we change our diagram. Yes, so we have an arrow from the feed view controller towards the feed loader. It's a closure, but it's an interface. It right? is. It's a signature. Exactly. And because it's an interface, we prefix and suffix with these greater less than symbols there. And this is a reference. This is a dependency as a reference from the feed view controller to the feed loader. That's why we choose the arrow with the closed head, basically. Yeah, it's a strong reference, actually. Yes. And we know that closures in Swift, they are reference types, just like classes. This could very well be a protocol. And we have the type alias there, feed loader. And feed loader seems like a fine name uh, for a protocol. And basically, it's exactly the same thing. It's a signature, right? Okay, so why don't we make this into a protocol then? Let's do it. So we wouldn't require much work. We can just change this to be a protocol now with one function, load feed for example. Right, and we need the completion there as a named parameter. And we can omit the return type of void. Because implicitly, return void. Yes. But now we cannot have a escaping protocol. <laughs> yes, and we can even change the name of the load feed var. Let's call it loader. Yeah, I like loader. And now it's loader.loadfeed. Since this is a protocol now, and we need to invoke a function on the protocol, where before we would just invoke a closure. And the diagram is still the same. Yes. I wouldn't change anything in the diagram. I agree with you. <laughs> they are very similar in concept. They are, because the feed view controller only knows basically about this load feed function. In the first example, it knew it through the closure. Here, it knows it through this protocol. But there is nothing else it can do with this feed loader type. A protocol with one method can always be replaced with a closure. I think that's fair to say. I think that's pretty much what it is. And some people prefer closure, some people prefer protocols. Pretty much a personal choice, I would say. Although we now depend on this named type feed loader, where before it could be any anonymous closure that match the type signature. Right. And naming is hard. It's one of those <laughs> big problems. But sometimes you want to name things to enforce some kind of contract. So a protocol defines better a contract. My advice would be use whatever you're comfortable with. If you're comfortable with protocols, go with protocols. But don't be afraid of getting out of the comfort zone and trying out some new ideas. Absolutely. Very important. <laughs> okay, so we have a feed view controller, we have a feed loader. Well, we can't do much with this. <laughs> we need someone to implement that. Exactly. Let's say we have a remote feed loader that implements the feed loader mm -hmm. interface. And when you call load feed, it's going to talk to an API layer, URL session, AF network, and call the completion when it's done. Right. Now, how does the diagram look like? So now we have this dashed line with the open head from the remote feed loader towards the feed loader, which means that the remote feed loader conforms to the feed loader protocol. And I decided to use some colors here to show how we can bundle those types into modules. Right? For example, the feed loader can live in the feed view controller module, but the remote feed loader, the implementation, can live in another module. That's why it has a different color. Let's say it's the blue module. It could be an API module, for example, or a service module. But they could also be all in the same module. But they shouldn't be immobile. right? That's why we create those separation of concerns. So if it's time to share these at some point or have a different implementation that we can replace, we can do it. We have options. Or facilitate testing. That's very important. Oh, definitely. <laughs> Yeah. So we can have a different implementation of the feed loader. Right, a local feed loader. Yes, for example, this local feed loader that just fetches some data from a cache system or even a predefined JSON file bundled in the app when you ship it. So if you don't have internet connection, you can still see something on the screen. Exactly. You can have a persistent store, you can have a cache mechanism, a JSON file, it doesn't matter. That's the beauty of the abstraction of the feed loader there. You can have a bunch of implementations conforming to a feed loader protocol and be passed around as a feed loader. And now we have a new type in our diagram. Okay, there it is. The local feed loader. That also implements the feed loader interface. It conforms to the feed loader interface and it can be in a separate module. That's why it has a different color, but you can have everything bundled in the same module, but we have options. Absolutely.
Now, imagine that your boss comes to you and say, I want you to always try to get the latest version from the remote, but if you have no internet connection, I want you to get data from the cache. <laughs> right, so I think that's a, that's a very reasonable requirement and it's often the case on iOS, it's a good user experience. And there's a bunch of ways we can do that. Yeah. Right? For example, some people might have some logic in the remote feed loader and say, you know what, this separation of concerns didn't work. I should have only one type that does everything. Right, and then you break the single responsibility <laughs> principle most probably. Yes, and maybe that's that's fine for you, right? But we often see cases where there are different approaches to the problem. Yes, it will be easier, not simpler, right? Yes, and I like the easy versus simple comparison. Because for example, an easy and often used approach is to change now our view controller to depend on the concrete types again. So right. for example, instead of talking to an interface, we now depend on concrete types. And then we need to introduce some sort of logic in the view controller to know which one we should call and when. So let's say if network is available, we use the remote one, otherwise we use the local cache. So now we make this code more complex rather than simple, but that was an easy change because you very quickly can do this change and move the tickets to done and move on. Absolutely. Let me just introduce the reachability stub just to compile this. Cool. So there you go. That was an easy change, fulfill the requirement, move on. Now we have two dependencies. They are both concrete and code is starting to get more immobile because every time there is a new requirement, we're going to come here and add more if statements more logic, and very easily, this view controller is gonna be a thousand lines long, and everybody is gonna be afraid of changing it. And our diagram now looks like this, which looks easier, you have less things, but I don't think it's simpler, because it's not simple to change this anymore. Yeah. I cannot change the behavior or the view controller without changing the internal code, which means it's not open for extension. Yeah, we're going towards rigid town here. <laughs> <laughs> so how can we go back and have the feedback controller depending on that interface, but it still have this new behavior? Right, so we can use composition. We can encapsulate this logic to a type that checks if the network is available, will fetch the remote. Otherwise, it's going to rely on the local version of the feed. So let's do that, and I'm going to undo the changes here. So we are back to having just the loader interface, but now we're going to add a new type. Right. So we move the same logic we added in the view controller, but now into a service. But again, how can we make the view controller talk to the service? We have to go to the view controller and change it if it's a concrete type like this. Yeah, the view controller talks to a feed loader. So if we make this remote with local fallback feed service conform to the feed loader protocol, we can then plug it to the view controller and the view controller remains agnostic from the provenance of the feed. And the remote feed loader also is agnostic of this, and the local feed loader is also agnostic of those types. Absolutely. These types are isolated, and they can be tested isolated. But here, we can compose them into this new type and separate the concerns throughout the system. So to do it, we can transform this service into actually a loader that also implements the feed loader interface. I like this change. It reflects the intent of the class based on the feed loader protocol. So what it does, it, it composes these two concrete types. As you can see, we're using the concrete types here to make sure we have the expected behavior. The compiler is going to help us here. So now, how does this look in the diagram? Seems scary. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see, the remote with local fallback feed loader implements the feed loader, and it depends on a remote feed loader and a local feed loader. Everything else hasn't changed, yes. which means the view controller has no idea of all this logic, which means we changed the behavior of the code without changing the view controller. We added a new way of composing these things. And I really like that because the feed view controller, it doesn't know where the feed is coming from and it doesn't care. And how easy we can test now the feed view controller there. Yeah, we can test everything here in isolation, which is great. And we can use the type system to help us compose those types together. And if you think this is a property of protocols, no, it's not. You can do the same with closures. Yeah, 
I'm very happy with this design. We can even simplify this code here. We can just forward the completion blocks, for example. And we can keep changing the implementation of these until we are happy with it. Let's say we have a load function that depending on the network state, we do one thing or the other. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter, right? As long as you conform to the interface, you can test this behavior and refactor the code until you're happy with it. For example, instead of having just one local, maybe you're going to have different types of fallbacks. Then you can have an array of fallbacks. It's up to you. As the requirements change, you don't have to break any other part of the system to add new behavior. And that's the open-close principle. Plus the dependency inversion. As long as you have this clear separation, you have options. And that's simple. <laughs> I would argue it's easy as well. If you know how to do it, it doesn't take more time. So one thing I would like to mention here is that uh, perhaps the diagram looks a little bit scary <laughs> with all these colors and all these blocks. But when we would instantiate all these types, I think it's much simpler. It could be a one-liner. <laughs> For example, you can create your view controller. Uh, it's a feed view controller. And we pass a loader, anything that conforms to the loader interface. For example, we can create it with a remote feed loader, or we can create another one with a local feed loader, or we can create another one that uses the remote with local fallback feed loader. Right. And then we pass the remote feed loader and the local feed loader, for example. That's my point here, that the code doesn't reflect the complexity of the diagrams. Because the thing is, this diagram is not complex. <laughs> that is, yeah, that is true. If you can read this, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> but in the beginning, I think it can be a bit daunting, especially for newcomers. Yes. And some people might say, well, so you're creating the feed view controller with those dependencies, which means I cannot use storyboards. Oh, right. Because I don't have control over the instantiation of my view controller. Well, is this a fallacy or not? I think it is. Yeah. Because what I can do is, for example, I can set my loader after it's created. We're shifting from initializer injection to property injection here. And now we can inject those dependencies. You can use custom segues. You can use custom objects in your storyboard or NIP files. We have a video where we show these techniques. You can find the link in the description. So there's no excuses. If you want to have composable types, it's a choice. It's just a choice. There's nothing magical about it. Right. You don't have to, but if you want to, you can. Yeah, I agree. And we can see here a bunch of the solid principles actually in action, right? And again, you can replace it with just closures. It's just a choice. All right, I think that's it for today. So I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something today. Don't forget to subscribe and check the links in the description. And we'll see you again next time.